Amen. If you remain standing, turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And today, since it will be a majority of an introduction to our new series and to the book, we'll only be covering verses 1 through 2, but there's a lot there. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Hear now the reading of God's word. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And this is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you all as we draw closer to the official start of summer and the temperatures and the weather are changing, is changing, and I'm sure everyone here in this room welcomes that. But I'm also excited to start a summer series in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, this is a very contemplative book. Some would say a difficult book. It's not very long at 12 chapters, but it's a deep book that gets to life's most difficult, tough questions. What to make of one's life lived? What is the purpose? What is the meaning? Or how to make sense of the world that we live in with things that are good, things that are evil and heinous, and things that are in the gray that seem to some of us somewhere in between. And speaking about making sense of life in this world, haven't our minds been oversaturated in that department over the last two to three years? And I'll just list off some of the things that might be weighing on us, stressing out our souls, even if we are really not even cognizant about that. We had a global life-altering pandemic with COVID-19. We had struggles in a divided nation that is ongoing, that has affected not just friendships, but many families, perhaps even families here. They've even divided long-standing churches over the division in our nation to more recently trying to make any sense of horrible violence in our cities, but also to little children to African Americans intentionally gunned down at a grocery store parking lot. Sheer mayhem, what is going on? Then on a more global scale, we have horrible wars and invasions, and then we have worldwide supply chain problems, inflation, poverty, racism, greed, and geopolitical chaos. Now that's just things outside of our world. What about us as individuals? Crises that revolve around perhaps health, or unsettled careers, or schooling decisions, or finances, or secular influence preferred over God's word and way. A lot of these things weigh on our souls. Now, granted, we're, we're in a very, very first world circumstance and landscape with a lot that we take granted for every day, but still, one can understandably say and maybe in a quiet prayer, driving to work or at home before you go to bed, what is going on, Lord? What is the meaning of all of this? What is the meaning of all our toiling and striving when the world is so chaotic out there? Is this even worth living for? What is the meaning of life overall? Why is there so much unconstrained evil, God? Why is this allowed to even happen? Questions that, understandably, can keep any of us up at night and bothered throughout the day. And if you're feeling those frustrations, that angst, that pent-up confusion, and even perhaps anger, well, the book of Ecclesiastes is an available resource to help you untangle some of life's tough and even excruciating questions relatable to those that are in a later st latter stage of life, looking back at all that has happened, to those who are younger here and have their whole lives ahead of you, there is a word for you too, especially in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And of course, all of those in between, trying to make sense of the purpose of our being. Now, growing up, I, I never really enjoyed when the teacher at school or even a Sunday school teacher at church would ask, Everyone, class, what is the meaning of life? I hated that question. I thought the question was too up in the stratosphere type of talk, too abstract, 
not very practical. I was intimidated by the question. So at that age, I never liked to think too much about it. And I just thought to myself, just live. That was my posture. Life's questions will be answered as you grow up and, and, and go along in life. But then sooner or later, like most of us, life gets too tricky to push off this question. We even have earlier theological confessions that help us along the way. What is the chief end of man? That's question number one. Well, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, a statement that we all should agree on. But sometimes we need lots of help unpacking what we even confess together, what we believe. And so I think the book of Ecclesiastes will help us in that regard. This book with close study will actually move your focus away from self and all of life's difficulties and complexities and move it to the sovereign creator God who rules over all things. This is the goal of the encouragement over the next two or three months. Now, if you've been intimidated or unmotivated by Ecclesiastes before, it's probably because you did a quick glance at some of the chapters and saw things like all is vanity or everything under the sun is meaningless and thought, that's not what I really need right now. That's a pretty depressing sentiment. I'll pass. But this isn't actually a depressing, fatalistic book, nor is this a really cheerful, optimistic book or a dark, pessimistic book. The author is a realist and is probably at an older age and looking back at all of life's lessons he has learned and is ready to share all of that with us. Now, in my mid-20s, I, I led a campus ministry, and every Sunday night, 40 or 50 student leaders would come and gather, and I would give a little devotional, and we would go over ministry strategies and all these kind of things. But one season, I said, all of you guys, you're just going to uh, team up or individually pick one. I'm going to assign you one book of the Bible. You're going to meditate on it for the next month or two. And then you're going to come back and stand up at the front and present the contents and the summary of that book to everyone. Well, I had a student who was assigned the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> and I quickly found out that he was not really happy that he got this assignment. And so he kind of slowly gets up to the front, and he has a downcast look as he goes up, and almost in a mumbling, depressed voice said, I was assigned Ecclesiastes. This book says that everything is meaningless. Life stinks and is pointless. We're all going to die. The end. <laughs> and people laughed because the report was so dark and depressing. We were kind of like, there, there, brother. You can come back now. But we can forgive this young person's point of view because if you quickly read the book to then summarize only in five minutes to other largely newish Bible students, the book does seem to tend to veer somewhat dark and almost unpleasant. But I guarantee you, with a closer read, brothers and sisters, and I hope that you could maybe even include this in your devotional reading every day, with the closer read and with the greater desire to get to the bottom of the author's intent, and of course by the illumination and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, this book actually is a marvelous insight into humanity, our lives on earth, how God plays the critical roles in our lives if we are truly to live with purpose, fulfillment, and contentment. Because as we will see as we go through this book, without God in our lives then truly we can say with the author of Ecclesiastes, then everything is meaningless. But more on that in the weeks to come as we seek to unpack the treasures of truth in this book. But I'll close my introduction to this series with a quote. Dr. Phil Riken helpfully summarizes the overall book's purpose from his commentary on Ecclesiastes. He says a very short excerpt. The book of Ecclesiastes cautions us not to put our hope in earthly pleasures and worldly treasures, but rather teaches us to put our hope in God instead. He goes on to say, Ecclesiastes is really about the meaningless of life without God, and his ultimate purpose is to show us how meaningful life can be when we see things from God's perspective.
Now that summarizing statement, friends, alone should make us excited to dig in to God's word and to not be afraid to, to pray to God like the psalmist, where are you? Are, are you near? Are you far? Have you forsaken us? Very honest and raw assessments of yourself and the world that you live in and just say, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to entrust my heart and soul to you as we go through your word. Ecclesiastes is there for a reason and purpose. So, Lord, I pray that you would minister to me and answer all these difficult questions through the reading of your holy word. And so if you're feeling hopeless today, when you turn on the news or you read the hundredth article on something so terrible, if you're feeling purposeless, as some of you have mentioned to me, if you're feeling useless, or if you're stuck in the rut of a stormy life, or even like the father from Mark chapter 9 a couple of weeks ago who said, I believe, help my unbelief, I, I really urge you then to stay with us, stick with us this summer as we dive into the instructive and profitable word of God. So let's go back to our very, two, very short verse introduction in chapter 1. If you have your Bibles open, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now the word there, if you could just underline that word preacher is translated from the Hebrew word koheleth. And the word koheleth draws from the word to gather, to assemble, and in our context here, to teach. And scholars point out that the word ecclesiastes actually is a derivative of the Greek word ekklesia. Some of you know that the word, the Greek word ekklesia in the New Testament means the church. Because in the New Testament, the church is an assembly of God's people, a gathering. It's not a location. It's not a building. I know that we kind of take that for granted and we say, oh, I'll meet you at church, which is on 2700 Highland Avenue. But of course, we know theologically the church is not a space or a building, but a place where a, a, a gathered people assembled together, covenant people of God, worshiping the Lord together. So Ecclesiastes is actually the Greek translation of the word Koheleth. And I mention this to draw the significance of the role of this Koheleth, this author of the book, to be the pastor preacher who is teaching the congregation of gathered believers. And so consider our digging into this book over the summer as having a guest preacher all summer visit with our sacred assembly and gathering of God's people. Now, Koheleth, the preacher, is how this author will be identified through the book. But in the beginning verse there, in verse 1, we see the identification as most likely King Solomon, David's son, as king ruling in Jerusalem. Historically, many think the author, of course, is Solomon, with many references throughout the book to so many parallels to his life. But some note that this also could have been someone writing in the persona of Solomon, the wisdom that would have come from Solomon's life experiences, so to say, also written as a, almost an homage to him. Whether this was indeed King Solomon's own words or someone, someone else's, this is in the Bible for a reason. But for our purposes, we'll refer to the author as Koheleth, the preacher, as the text says. So I still, of course, personally believe that this was Solomon as he was front row in achieving and having everything under the sun in his up and down life. And if there was ever anyone who could grant us deeper insight into the complexities of life, everything under the sun, it was surely King Solomon. Now to the more complex verse today, vanity of vanities, what a way to start a series, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. If I said amen, have a good lunch, see you later, a lot of us would be pretty, leaving pretty confused or puzzled by the meaning of this verse. What an impactful way to start. Vanity in the Hebrew, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, comes up around 38 times in this book. It's a main theme, of course, from this author. But it's not what we think of in the English language today, where today we hear vanity as someone who's obsessed with his or her own beauty or worth or value or significance or popularity. That's how we use vanity mostly today. 
But 3,000 years ago, because if this was Solomon, this was about 1,000 B.C. written, vanity meant, quote, a vapor, something temporary, a mere breath. And that's why I love how Allison kind of gave us that, that graphic for our sermon series. It's a mist, a mist, a vapor, something here today but gone tomorrow. And so scholars note that in this context, vanity of vanities is the hyperbolic language to describe all that is frustrating in life, all that is temporary, all that is perplexing to you. This is the phrase you would use. When you throw up your hands after reading an article or something happens at work or something at home or something with a child and so on and so on, you, you, back then you would say vanity of vanities. Oh, how perplexing, frustrating. Oh, how transient and temporal, uh, temporary, the life that we live. And so when you see vanity of vanities, that just means life is but a vapor, life is short, life is full of frustrating complexities, something along those lines. Now, King Solomon or this preacher may have lived a very adventurous, a very intense life, but, but perhaps he fell into the common thought that Hey, I'm invincible. My health, my wealth, my relationships, my status. Oh, I have unlimited time on earth. Did many of us think like that when we were younger? Or maybe you are young here today or streaming and you think, I have the rest of eternity here on earth uh, in this lifetime. You just feel like indestructible. That everything that I want to plan or think should go a certain way will come to fruition. That's the human experience. We fall into that trap over and over and again. And when life passes us by with lightning speed, we come to the conclusion, vanity of vanities. And the verse concludes then with even a more emphatic statement, all is vanity. Not just certain things King Solomon or this Koheleth is saying, but everything, everything, all is vanity. The all in verse 2 is in relation to uh, what we'll be preaching on, Lord willing, next Sunday. Verse 3, it, it's coinciding with everything under the sun. Meaning every last category of life is vanity, is vapor, is temporary, is a breath. But also everything under the sun is complex, frustrating, and perplexing. Now the preacher opens up the book with an intense first serve, let's say. But it's not fair to judge the pre preacher on his opening premise until we hear what he actually means, his explanation. And this theme that life is just a vapor and all our pursuits seem to be meaningless, we have to wait to hear what he means by all of this. It's almost like those of us who have graduated from university or college, some of us recently, some of us years ago, and then you end up doing something entirely different from what you studied, and you might look back, <laughs> as, as I do often, <laughs> and say, why didn't I study history or literature or et cetera, et cetera, it has nothing to do, I, I did like computer stuff, consulting stuff, it has nothing to relate to pastoral work, and you might think, vanity of vanities, that was pointless. But we need the preacher to help us when we think about such things, wasted time. Some of us, we think, a wasted life. Don't just judge it on the first two verses. Let all of the chapters, we have to give him that understanding, that uh, platform to teach us what he means. Because we don't want to walk out of here depressed from such an intense opening. And I think a very likely complete theme that we'll eventually see from this book, and I'll maybe just change this summarizing statement, but here's what I said from this past week, is that life is fleeting, so therefore trust in the Lord and live for him. As, we, as the chapters unfold, I think you'll, you'll, you'll catch some of that. Maybe you have a better summarizing verse, uh, uh, um, um, statement, a sentence that you could share with me, you can email with me. Life is fleeting. That's where we're at right now, verse 1 through 2. But as we see and go to the very end, the preacher says, therefore, trust in the Lord. 
If you want to see meaning in your life, trust in the Lord alone and live. Live from this is not just some theoretical massaging from the preacher. He wants us to live for God. And he knows that this is the only path to true fulfillment, true joy, happiness. Social media and the media and TV shows and commercials and just even our conversations around a coffee table, everyone is saying, I have the, the latest thing that will give you joy and happiness, and I think this might be it for you, right? We, we, we get inundated with that all the time. But the preacher 3,000 years ago is saying, the only path to true fulfillment and meaning in this life is through our Lord, our God. And we'll circle back to this at the end. But I just want to apply what we have heard today. As we introduce this book to our own church, our own gathered sacred assembly, let's start to warm up our evaluation of how we look at life thus far. For those who have many decades under the belt, to those still in school here today, we all have a part to play to see how relevant this confrontation of our souls really is. Why is life frustrating for you? Really, this matters at every age, at every season of life. This is not just for people under 25 or people over uh, 65 in retirement age. This is for, it matters for every age, for every season. I remember coming home after school. I can't remember if it was in middle school or high school. Sometimes really frustrated with life. And you were like, you were 12 or you were 15 or 16. How, how could life be very frustrating? But for those of you guys who are that age, you, you understand, right? You don't have a full-time job, a career, or family yet. But sometimes life can get really frustrating. For me, if I would come back from the, from the bus, or if I, I don't remember exactly what age I was, and I would be walking to my door, I would be overcome with this sense of heaviness. And you're going to almost laugh internally, hopefully, uh, about the reason why. But in that certain day, if I didn't feel like I was popular... I would walk home really sad, really dark. I don't know why. So I would watch some cartoons and kind of snap myself out of it. But days where I felt like, oh, I was funny enough, people seemed to like me, maybe I'm gaining a little bit more popularity, I was skipping all the way home. Or fast forward to my church planting days in my 30s. There were moments I felt I was floating on clouds because church Planting was so exciting and fun. But other days, oh, I was utterly frustrated at the complexities of life or of human sinners getting together and having to deal with sin even inside the church. Those were some dark days. To the recent days or years of utter frustrations at viruses, war, shootings, violence, vitriol, and hate, life in a fallen world is often not very delightful at all. Now, of course, this is different for every individual here. Maybe some of the uh, examples I gave you can't relate to, but I know that there are things there that frustrate you, that make you confused and perplexed in life that is fleeting. But the point is, no matter how different our experiences may be, that in every season of life we can agree with the preacher in Ecclesiastes of vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Life without God and living in him or identifying ourselves as sons and daughters of Almighty God. If you move away from that thought process and that understanding and life without God and living in him is truly destructive, self-absorbed, and really just a dead end. And thanks be to God that he is gracious, he's forgiving, he is so patient over every single one of us because we have to learn this lesson over and over again. We, we might go through a season and say, why is my soul so downcast? I have the creator God of all things who is my heavenly father. And you go through a season of rejoicing in that identity. And then the next week or the next month, perhaps even the next year, you start all over again and say, oh, because I'm so consumed with my circumstances in my life and things not going my way, I am lost, O oh God. And we learned that lesson again. It's because, Robin, you're trying to live life without God, without the appropriate perspective. That's what's actually depressing life 
without God. We'll soon see that the preacher is trying to tell us, stop trying to figure out life and this fallen world with your own lenses. Life is actually not meaningless if you look through the perspective of Almighty God, who is sovereign, who is good, who is all the time in control. Younger ones here today, when life seems confusing and upside down, ask God to turn any doubt into sturdier faith and trust that God is sovereign, good, and all the time in control. Whether you're scared of life, fearful of life, fearful of what is to come, fed up with life's ups and downs, don't let your eyes drift from God, your creator, even those who are young here. Many who are older than you today, like I am, will say amen to that too, not just for the younger ones here. I need to hear that from the preacher today just as much, just as timely for the world around us and indwelling sin in us is enough to get us frustrated, perplexed, and confused. And there is hopelessness without the perspective of God. But what often moves our gaze away from Christ and the purpose of God is whatever that's under the sun that currently is gripping you with obsession and your attention, your daily pursuit, that's what moves our gaze away from Christ and Almighty God. What do you cling so heavily upon? Your career path. The fulfillment is only found when I'm satisfied, thriving, and happy in my career. Or your family. The true fulfillment is only found when every child in the family is the ultimate behaving and obedient human being ever made. Is that what you're clinging your hopes on? Or is it your social status, your bank account? Some of us young or older, our Xbox or game consoles, our friends, something you've built in life that you look back on with pride and you say, that's fulfillment under the sun. And then it could be just stripped and taken away from you in a split second. If any or all of those things becomes your all in all, Friends, you'll lament with the preacher and say, all is vanity. Do you imagine, if it is King Solomon, that there were points in his life when he thought, I have everything under the sun, and then he comes to the conclusion, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I have stripped my vision of the Lord God Almighty, and I've chased after things that truly do not satisfy. I come to the conclusion, maybe this is written here once at the beginning, but maybe every week, every month for King Solomon, he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And without, for us, the hope of Christ and what life he offers you while humbly substituting his own life on the cross some 2,000 years ago as that one and true atonement for your sins, without that hope of Christ, we will and we should leave out of here and say, all truly is vanity. But when we place ourselves in faith, in the wonderful, never-ending, never-loosening grip of Jesus Christ, we'll see that life has a new meaning, a new purpose. Life is a gift given to us so that we can live for Christ and the purposes of God. We just have to see correctly. That's why I'll conclude with what the preacher ends the whole book with, the second to last verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13. The preacher concludes by saying, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's not fatalism. That's not mere depressive talk. That is saying, if you want meaning in life, fear God and keep his commandments. Follow the whole duty of man. This loving union with Jesus Christ in the fear of the Lord, true submission to the Lord, is what makes all of life worthwhile. And we can't help but want to follow him then. For he is the only one who can help us make sense of this world and our duty. You might have remembered me saying in previous terms that Latin phrase, quorum Deo. Quorum Deo means in the presence of. And usually theologians use that theologically to depict a person's life is to be lived in the presence of our creator, under his authority and to his glory and pleasure. That's quorum Deo. That's every day for us, Christian. And as a preacher will depict to us, slowly but surely, like a sure-handed surgeon of the spiritual heart, without the attitude of quorum Deo, a response to the good news 
gospel of Jesus Christ, life then truly is simply vanity. But as we'll see, the meaningless will become meaningful once we put Christ our Lord at the center of it all. And so brothers and sisters, come back, hopefully, <laughs> throughout this whole summer, prayerfully journey through this book together, and may God change us and transform us inside out. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to humbly come before you and your word that you would give us courage to be confronted by books that we wouldn't readily read or devote time to, that all, your, uh, all God's word is God-breathed, is useful for us, profitable for us, teaching and rebuking, convicting us. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would see that, we would have faith given by you, God. Would you strengthen our faith to see that, that it doesn't have to be scary to be confronted by your word. For when we follow your way and your path and the ways of righteousness through your holy word, we cannot go wrong. So, Lord, may we courageously and bravely and boldly and, and with much faith follow you, Lord, especially this summer in this series. May it grow our church. May it transform us. May it spiritually uplift our souls so that we can devote the whole duty of man unto you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.